We're here to talk about the arc of New York City. So it's an arc that begins in the heady days of Mad Men and John Lindsay in the 1960s. So this is the world that I was born into, and consequently my memory is maybe less sharp than yours. But can you help recreate what the New York of 1965 was, was like? Well, you know, Lindsay ran, it had been a Democratic, it is an overwhelmingly Democratic city. It was three to one Democratic registration then. It's more now. Um, and he ran against, quote, the bosses. Uh, and the Democratic, quote, machine, as it was called, uh, dominated this city in the post-war, post-LaGuardia years mm -hmm. of, of World War II. Um, and he ran against uh, Democratic candidates and said we need a change and he was young and handsome and vibrant and and he promised change and Murray Kempton the great New York Post columnist said uh, he's fresh and everyone is tired and and the fresh candidate in a multi-candidate race won and one of the things he did uh, he felt good about himself and felt very good about liberalism mm -hmm. and he was going to expand it and deal with income inequality, et cetera. So over the first five years of his two terms, but it's four-year terms, uh, he increased the budget, the annual city budget every year by 16%, an average of 16%, at a time when the city was losing jobs. And it's worthwhile remembering that New York had been an industrial powerhouse, right? The largest industrial cluster in the U.S. in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production right here in New York. And that was an industry that was facing some tough competition from globalization, right? Making garments in New York is a tough, is a tough business when you've got competition from low-wage states in the South and, and across the oceans. The city lost uh, a million uh, manufacturing jobs um, in that period of time that spanned his, Lindsay's mayoralty and, and, and after, the, the first five years after the Beam administration. And it was, it was just, you know, and Lindsay and a lot of local officials were ignoring that reality. Uh, because that was the tax base, just f and the jobs just fleeing. Crime was going up, but not just crime, but the c types of crime that was particularly troublesome. It, it, if you looked at the statistics of murder by stranger, uh, it used to be that murders were committed within families by someone you sure, knew. Absolutely. Now what you were facing uh, in the Lindsay years and, and after that w was uh, murder by, by stranger, which means someone you didn't know uh, pulling, uh, putting a bullet in your head. And, and that was particularly terrifying. I'll never forget um, going out with, uh, this was post Lindsay years, so it's in the 70s, going out with a group of cops who, whose task was to track career criminals. And career criminals were the recidivists who were responsible for a disproportionate amount of crime. And the idea was that if we followed these people, identify them, follow them, and then work with the DA to prosecute them, uh, for crimes and put them away, we would dramatically reduce crime. Eventually that worked. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I'll never forget going out at night, I mean after midnight, with a guy by the name of Vinnie Pepitone, who was Joe Pepitone, the former Yankee great ball mm -hmm. player. His brother, younger brother, went out and, and he was six foot three. He was a big guy. And he takes his, his gun out of his holster and puts it in his leather jacket on a winter night. And I said, why is it in your jacket, not your holster? And he said, these are crazy people out here. You know, they can kill you. So this six foot three cop was afraid. And cops were fearful because they were dealing with really difficult, often crazy people. So we have this amazing New York mayoral race of, of 77, right? The That's where Ed Koch, uh, you know, and it really is a reminder that, that people uh, are not who they first appear to be. Mm -hmm when they eventually succeed. Koch, is a, as a member of Congress, was a fairly colorless guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he had very strong opinions, and he was quirky in sure, what he absolutely. said. Sure, and, and interesting because of that. But he ran, and ultimately, the position he took was very different than the position most of the other candidates took, and the position that Abe Beam, before the incumbent, had taken. He basically said, the city, there are lots of things that are happening to New York uh, beyond our control. But the mayor of New York really has to say, we are responsible. And we have to look at what we can change here and what, what we are responsible for to ha having created this 
financial crisis. And that set him apart from mm -hmm. the other candidates and, and, and imbued him with a sense of candor and honesty. He stood out that way. And I remember I covered that campaign as a daily news columnist and then wrote a long mm -hmm. two-part New Yorker after he was elected series on it, Profile of Koch. Mm -hmm. And that's really what stood out. He, he, was, he was different. And he was basically telling the public what most politicians dare not tell them. We are responsible. We have to do more. You're going to have to sacrifice. I'm going to have to sacrifice. And that's what he did. In order to do what he said the larger issue was, how do we reclaim home rule? How do we get back our democratic government in the city of New York? And he succeeded at that, and that's one of the reasons he'll go down as a, one of the great mayors. Absolutely, and it, it, although it perhaps it tells a lesson of how far a city has to be gone before it's willing to accept you know, the truth, right. that, that right. all cities right. ultimately need right. to be responsible for right. themselves. Uh, and they do have to let fiscal problems stand in the way of achieving everything that they want to, want to do. And if they try to tax the rich and firms too much, people will move elsewhere. That they don't have they don't have a monopoly on that. Koch was not had no administrative no. experience as a member of Congress. He was a legislator his whole life, uh, but he picked good people, mm -hmm. and and had a good memory, and was smart, and he held them accountable. Yeah, and he delegated. He knew how to delegate. And even his, his catchphrase, right, how am I doing, is itself an, an admission of accountability, right? He's asking, he's asking in his own humorous way the public to grade him on a daily, on a daily basis. One of the arguments I, I, I made um, in the first book I wrote, which was about New York City and, and the, this crisis, and, and would make in the columns I would write and, and still believe to this day, is that the old uh, characterizations of liberal and conservative don't apply in this. I mean, I, I would argue that if you're a Koch and you're opposing a transit strike and wanting to enforce the Taylor Law, uh, you are basically consumer protection. Mm -hmm. You're pro-consumer protection. Is that a conservative position or a liberal position? You know, And, and if you say that, that I don't want to spend 20% of my budget for debt service, I want to spend it on services for the city of New York. Why is that conservative? And, and so I think that the, the, these old categories don't really apply in, in a city like that. 